Uh, so what I'll be talking about is some of the work I've been doing uh, pretty much since I got started in my faculty, faculty career, which was uh, doing inference for functional magnetic resonance imaging, basically figuring out where are the blobs in these uh, colorful statistic images that uh, these brain scanners produced. Um, and I, I got my start doing um, with sort of simple, I would say computationally intensive, uh, but not very technical methods and permutation, later got involved in working with this thing called uh, random field theory, which is basically a really, really dull Gaussian process, um, where we actually even assume that it's exactly mean zero uh, and has a known covariance function. But that actually turns out to be a very useful thing for, for inference. So I will start by just trying to introduce uh, the area in general and then uh, focus on this multiple testing uh, problem uh, that uh, is, is kind of central to, to my work, and then get to kind of the meat of it, which is evaluations with real data, which is, so it's, in a way, it's, this is kind of like where I started in my career, and is kind of some, uh, relates to some old work, and this is work I did just last summer, which uh, surprisingly resulted in a, in a sort of a much discussed uh, paper. Okay, so uh, the core of my work uh, relates to functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, it's based on this really amazing property that the blood running around in your body basically is a contrast agent. We all know that blood goes from blue to red as, ex as it's exposed to oxygen, but it turns out that the magnetic properties of blood also change as it uh, gains and loses uh, oxygen. And so it turns out you can use a regular old MRI scanner uh, to, to see changes in intensity that are related to changes in blood flow blood oxygenation and, and blood volume. Uh, the, the simple thing is that, and we call it the blood oxygenation level effect, is if you t tell someone to line a scanner and then tap their fingers like this, um, in general, most of the brain will show no systematic changes because you don't need most of your brain to do this. But if you can find the parts of your brain which are responsible for moving your fingers and feeling the sensation of your thumb touching your fingertips, uh, you will, in that brain region, you will find a pattern of activity like this that goes up and down uh, with the, uh, the, 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 the uh, demands, the ox oxygen demands necessary for controlling uh, your fingers in this fashion. So in fact, most experiments that are done with fMRI are not this boring, you just use fingers. They, psychologists come up with complex experiments that investigate and that interrogate sort of how we have memories and how we react to emotional things, but this is the basis uh, of, of the technique. So uh, it is a large data setting. We get anywhere from 100,000 to say a million uh, measurements inside the brain. Um, but we actually use rather simple methods, uh, typically, to analyze this data. We actually fit a, a, a univariate model, a time series model, at each point in the brain. So we're going to fit a model that's trying to explain the anticipated variation that has been induced by some experiment. Uh, and then we are going to uh, test for the, the presence of a non-zero effect. Uh, and doing that at every single point in the brain gives us a statistic image. So it's an image of statistics. Every point in the brain is a, under the normal hypothesis, a t-statistic, uh, following it, the normal distribution, the, the standard, uh, the, the anticipated uh, reference to normal distribution. But the problem is which parts of the brain are actually engaged. If we use a really low threshold, then actually we'll probably be getting a very powerful result, not missing very much. Um, but there will definitely be some false positives here, so sensitive but not specific. We use a very high threshold. We'll actually get a very sort of uh, not so powerful result, but whatever comes through we probably can believe in. And the problem, of course, is if we just use classical hypothesis testing and just use a no nominal, say, 5% threshold, and we have 100,000 voxels, just by chance we'll get 5,000 false positive voxels. So that's the nature of the multiple testing problem, and we need some principled method to decide what is the right threshold in a classical hypothesis testing, testing setting uh, that controls multiple, the, the multiple uh, false positives. But the thing you run into is that once you leave the warm, fuzzy world of a single uh, hypothesis test, what is a false positive? When you have 100,000 tests, what does it mean to be wrong? And it turns out that there are, there's no one definition. There's actually multiple definitions. Uh, I unfortunately wasn't able to be there for the second day of the OXWASP uh, uh, retreat, but I did suggest the Benjamin and Hotberg paper. I don't know if anyone read that paper. That's, of course, the false discovery rate. The kind of the default and kind of most uh, sort of, the, I guess, oldest uh, traditional measure of false positives is the family-wise error rate, and that is just where you de define a family-wise error to be the presence of one or more false positives, and then the family-wise error rate is just the chance of one or more false positives. 
I'm not going to talk about the false discovery rate at all, but it is, these are the two main approaches to multiple testing that are used uh, in, in brain imaging, and I would say probably much of science. So uh, to introduce these methods, I will talk about the link between the, the maximum distribution and the family-wise error, because it's pretty crucial. If you've ever heard of the Bonferroni method, um, a lot of, especially psychologists or uh, doctors will say, oh, I know about all about multiple testing. That's the Bonferroni method. Well, of course, Bonferroni, where you just take the alpha level and divide it by the number of tests, is just one of many methods that control the family-wise error rate. There's nothing particularly special about it. What is special about it is that it always works. It actually works for any kind of dependence. It can be very conservative, but it actually uh, is always is guaranteed to be, to be valid. Okay. So uh, the family-wise error rate is the probability that of a family-wise error occurring. How can you get a family-wise error when there is nothing going on in the image? Well, the only way you can get an image, uh, an error, is when you have one or more test statistics that are above whatever your chosen threshold is you. But then that's the exact same event as the largest test statistic falling above this threshold U, right? So this is saying if you are trying to get a grasp on the family-wise error rate, you need to get a grasp on the maximum distribution. Now, of course, for independent uh, random variables, this is an easy exercise to work that out. But of course, we are not working with independence. We have correlated voxels. We have correlated data. So this is not trivial. But if we could get our hands on the distribution, it's actually just like, in a way, like univariate hypothesis testing. If we could just find the 95th percentile of this maximum distribution, I can take that away, and that quantity there would be a threshold that I could apply to all my tests. And any tests that fall above that, I can reject the hypothesis there, and, and, and I know with the knowledge that I'm controlling the risk of one or more false positives at 5%. So that's cool. So all I need to do is get a grasp on this. So how can we do this? For general dependence, there's no, there's no easy way to get this. But there is some, uh, an approach that has been widely used in brain imaging, um, which is what they call random field theory. So it's based on this connection to the, uh, the basically topology of, of, of random sets. Um, consider this is a, 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 a visualization of a 2D uh, random process. This is a Gaussian process, mean zero, uh, variance one. Uh, and if you consider thresholding that at a low threshold, higher, or higher, or higher, um, you can then sort of you can define the Euler characteristic on these sets. So the Euler characteristic in 2D is a number of blobs, a number of contiguous uh, regions, minus the number of holes. In 3Ds, it's the number of blobs minus number of holes plus number of handles. On a, on a mug, um, and and actually, what's what's handy? Well, first of all, you note if the, the threshold is sufficiently high, there are no more holes, like in this little monster face up there. there are no holes there uh, in this image. And then, if you go up high enough, you actually get to the state where it's only zero or one, right? It's just zero one. It's it's one. It's one if you're below the highest mountaintop, and it's going to be zero if that threshold is above the the highest value. And so it turns out this is exactly this is exactly very useful for us. Family-wise error, of course, is when the largest voxel is above the threshold you're using. That's the same event as there being one or more blobs. That is, if we're in this domain, it can be approximated by the probability of the Euler characteristic being greater than one. And if we say we're actually going to be up here, we're going to use sufficiently high thresholds, then this can be this probability can be approximated by the expected value of the Euler characteristic. So that on its own doesn't really solve anything. We've just replaced one hard problem with another hard problem. But it turns out there are actually really uh, convenient and accurate results for the expected value of an Euler characteristic uh, as derived from uh, a random field like this. Um, it turns out the simplest result for Gaussian random fields looks like this. So it's really simple. There's no simulation. There's no nasty integrals. It's just the volume of the search region times a measure of its roughness. Uh, and then some function of, of the, the threshold where you're, where you're cutting off those, those mountaintops. Um, and so and here's a plot of the that's Euler characteristic for all possible thresholds. Now you can see sometimes it takes on a value of a negative 15. That sounds like a really bad way to approximate a probability. With negative 15? Yeah. So it, we're only saying that this, this again, this, we only said it would probably it should work up here. And that's a reflection of it. We're only trying to use it up here to approximate the upper tail of that maximum distribution, basically. That, that's, that's essentially what we're, what we're doing. And there are a number of assumptions to this. This is for a, a Gaussian process, where that means that our data has to be multivariate normal. The standard results are, assume stationarity. And crucially, there's this measure, there's this definition of, of smoothness. And the, the, the operating definition of smoothness is that the spatial autocorrelation function needs to have two derivatives at zero. So if your ACF is like an exponential like this, 
then there's no reason that these results would work. We have to assume that there's, there's some measure of, of, of smoothness. Okay, so those are the standard results for, uh, oh, and, and the reason why these have become standard is because there is just a, a rich sort of extensive theory uh, for these. So that result that I just showed you has been generalized to a general uh, re uh, result for, for chi-squared fields, F fields, T fields, all these useful statistical entities that we get out of uh, a brain imaging data when we fit a univariate uh, linear model to them. Because, of course, with a linear model, you could get a chi uh, an F test uh, off of it. Um, we don't, yeah, but generally we don't use the chi-squared result very much, but we, these t, t and F field results are really the core of the, the results that we use. And this expression, the expected value of this Euler characteristic for a given search region, only it breaks down into a sum over uh, d dimensions, and it breaks into two terms. One that depends only on the characteristics of the search region, uh, and then the, another one that only depends on the characteristics of the, the, the field, so whether it's T field, F field, or, or, or uh, chi squared field, or, or what have you. And this is pretty cool because this is basically accounting for things like you, you can imagine that the behavior of excursions in a volume, uh, a sphere of a given volume, and the behavior of excursions in a really, 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 really long sausage that has the same volume, they're going to have different behavior. And that actually gets captured by this first ter term, these uh, Minkowski functionals of the search region. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, the other way these, these results are used are for making inference based on the extent of the signals. So this is something that, that I would say is the, 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 the mathematics uh, the sort of uh, the, the theory is not very as is not as elegant, but the users have found these tests incredibly sensitive, and they 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 basically are a workhorse uh, of uh, of the of the methods that are used. Um, I would say more people use these methods than the, the ones just based on the intensity. So what do you do? So you use a cluster defining threshold. You apply some arbitrary threshold to the process or the statistic image, as illustrated here. So here we might use a fairly low one. This corresponds to a z of 1.64. And then we get some blobs. And then we assess the significance of the effects in these brain images by how big the blobs are. So our test statistic has gone from a z value, t value, what have you, to how many voxels? What is the volume? That's our test statistic. And if the volume is sufficiently large, we reject the null hypothesis for that cluster. And if not, then we say it's consistent with noise. So I won't go into the details, but the, you can use this very same, the, the Euler characteristic, the expected. So this is how you work out the moment, uh, the, the average uh, size of a cluster. The average size is actually just going to be the total excursion volume, which actually, on average, is the same across all, whether you have a smooth or rough field, and divided by the number of blobs. Well, the number of blobs is given to us by the expected Euler characteristic. And we don't even need to assume that there are, um, we only need to assume there are no holes. We don't have to be up in that 0, 1 domain. So that gives us the, the first moment, the, the expected size of a cluster. And then there are some results that tell us how to, uh, what is the distribution. So basically a, uh, a, a, an exponential, a, a, a power of those cluster sizes falls an exponential distribution for a Gaussian random field. And for T fields, there's a much more complicated result. But again, these things are not, are not too, too nasty. So, so we know the, the average size of a, of a cluster uh, under the null hypothesis. This tells us the distribution of the size of one cluster under the null hypothesis. And the last step is, of course, we need to correct for searching over the whole brain to find these clusters. And so that's where we have to use uh, for the family-wise error. We have to figure out what the maximum distribution is. Or actually, what we use, we can just use a Bonferroni. The, the, the key thing is that their clusters, unlike individual voxels, are roughly independent. And so Bonferroni is not so bad. And there's also a fancier thing you can use, the Poisson humping, uh, clumping heuristic. Um, and they give, they give quite similar, similar answers. So the bottom line is that this, this set of results can be used to basically tell us how do threshold images, either based solely on the intensity of the statistical uh, finding or the spatial extent of the finding. Um, so there are problems with these the results. So they basically, they, they, we use them because they're, they're great. They're closed form. They, they're not, they don't require any iterative or, or, or approximating intervals. Um, uh, and they only depend on the volume, how big is the search region you're, you're, you're looking at, and how smooth is the data. Uh, the problem is, is that we, of course, have to know that we know that smoothness or roughness. That was that determinant lambda term. We have to know that, assume that's known. We don't actually account for the uncertainty in that. So we have to estimate it. And the, the key thing is, of course, these are beautiful results for continuous random processes, but we only ever observe data on a finite grid, right? So nice theory, we actually live in discrete land. Uh, 
when there is sufficient smoothness, this is actually a decent approximation. But there are some, so for example, uh, I work with people who are MR physicists. They do fancy things with trying to get the highest resolution possible out of the data, and they do not smooth their data at all. Um, they can't use these results, because they, they just, they, there's no smoothness. There's very little smoothness in the data they, they use. The psychologists that I work with are happy to smooth. They're happy to give up some local detail in exchange for reduced variance and greater sensitivity. And so these results are useful for them. Uh, what else do we have to see in the multivariate normality? And of course, there are some approximations. I was talking about how the threshold has to be sufficiently high, and this is all, these are all ways of just approximating the upper tail of the maximum distribution. So the other uh, class of methods that's out there is uh, permutation. Um, hopefully you've seen or uh, will have uh, soon see non-parametric methods, see, that is, your grandfather's non-parametric methods, not like these fancy modern infinite dimensional ones. Uh, this is uh, where you basically just use the data itself to come up with the null distribution. So I think there's probably not in this crowd, but oftentimes there's a lot of confusion about non-parametrics being sort of rank-based methods. Rank-based methods were only invented because you weren't able to do what sort of Fisher originally proposed, which was if you're comparing two groups, why don't you reanalyze your data all possible ways by flipping the identity of who belongs to each group? You ran if you're comparing patients to controls, why don't, if, and you believe the null hypothesis is true, randomly assign, reassign all your subjects to patients and controls, reanalyze your data, do it again and again and again, and you can get a null distribution that's coming from your data itself instead of having to make assumptions about where the data uh, was drawn. And so this is cool. And, and so the, we are using standard statistics. We're going to use the standard general linear model. We're going to use all the standard statistics that are being used. We're not going to do fancy different me methods uh, in general, but you could use other statistics if you wanted to. Uh, this just prevents us from having to make specific assumptions about the Gaussianity at each point. And to be honest, like, the Gaussianity is not a bad, we have the central limit theorem kicking in, it's not really a problem. Where it is a problem, of course, is when we want to deal with a multiple testing problem. And I was telling you that we only have this approximation for the upper tail of this distribution under random field theory, and there are, can be problems with random field theory, which we'll get to. So this is where actually the permutation uh, methods are actually really useful is using the datum itself to come up with the empirical distribution of the maxima. Because again, if we find the 95th percentile of this maximum distribution, we then have a, a way to get a threshold that will, we can apply to the image and be sure that we're controlling the chance of one or more false positives at 5%. Okay, so uh, I'll just show you an illustration of these two methods applied to real data. This is uh, an old study from back when I was first a faculty member of 12 subjects. Uh, of uh, trying to compare this, these two different conditions where you're shown five letters and you need to remember them for a brief period, and then you're shown a letter and you have to say yes, no, was this letter in that, that set you're, you're asked to remember. And then under baseline condition, because the thing is, and this is the craft of brain imaging, we want to compare to two different states, but the, the scientist studying working memory doesn't care about the fact that you're reading letters on a screen or pressing your fingers against a button. So you try to come up with a control condition that has as many things that are sim the same. So here in the control condition, you're shown a series of X's uh, or a different of letters, and there's nothing to remember. And then you're, just, you're shown a Y or an N, and that tells you which button to press. So hopefully, when we compare the brain state under these two different conditions, all the things of looking at a screen, uh, thinking whether to, whether actually moving your fingers to press a button or not, should cancel out. And the only thing that should be different is the brain activity involved in remembering a set of words and then retrieving that, that letter. So the, the analysis roughly boils down to basically doing, uh, within each subject, we just average the data under the active and the baseline conditions. We do it more fancy than that, but basically that's what's happening. And then once we have that difference image for each subject, we do a one sample t-test uh, on those, that difference data. So uh, in this kind of permutation, we, uh, when we only have one sample data on differences, uh, the permutation uh, becomes equivalent to a, a wild bootstrap, which in one variant is uh, where you basically flip the sign of each subject's data. So there are 12 subjects. There are 12, two to the 12 ways to either flip or not flip the sign of each subject's data. So here is the empirical maximum distribution uh, from this, this data. So I just reanalyzed the data 4,096 times, and uh, that's the empirical distribution. Uh, that's the 95th percentile. That gives me a threshold. I can apply to the data, and I find these three brain regions uh, actually uh, that pop out, which actually are the anticipated ones. This is the thalamus, the parietal region, and a frontal brain region that uh, have been expected to be identified with this working memory uh, task.
Um, and the thing that was surprising me and which motivated some of my work was the comparisons with the parametric theory. So we could compare it to Bonferroni, where that's just we take the 0.05 divided by the number of tests. Or we could use the random field theory, again, which only depends on these two quantities, the, uh, the, the, vo the search region, how the volume of that, and the smoothness and, uh, or roughness. And these are different ways of expressing it, but this is the full width maximum, uh, uh, full width at half maximum size of a kernel that expresses the smoothness in this, this image data. And the thing that surprised me uh, early on is that this, empiric, this permutation method, which in general should be the same or probably not any more powerful than the parametric method, was actually way more powerful. Um, this is a parametric result where you almost get nothing out of these. And if you, you can even, and you can try different, using different test levels. It doesn't matter whether you use 0.01 instead of 0.05 or 0.1. There's still a considerable difference between the parametric and the non-parametric uh, thresholds. You can also do funky things because we're working non-parametrically and things like, well, maybe we could regularize the variance. So in a t-statistic, just smooth the denominator, the square of the denominator, uh, and leave the numerator alone. And then you find that actually gives you actually a lot more sensitivity. That's basically, it's almost like a Bayesian idea. We're basically saying, I believe our, uh, our variance image should be uh, smooth. And I can tell you, when, when you only have 11 degrees of freedom, it isn't that smooth. You actually get uh, low degrees of freedom noise creeping in there. And so a little bit of smoothing actually improves the sensitivity, something you couldn't do in a standard parametric framework. Uh, and so I went on to compare and look at a lot of different data sets. And you basically see that, so I would never encourage anyone to just analyze five subjects. But if you did, the random field theory result would say you need a t-value of 4,700 uh, to be significant. And that's pretty high. Um, and so it's not until you get up to, say, 20 <laughs> subjects or so that the random field theory results start to become close to the permutation results. And so this is, um, I, and then I went on and I sort of had a, a series of papers where I looked at uh, comparing these two different approaches in, uh, in, in different settings, so different degrees of data, uh, different sample sizes, and different degrees of smoothing. But this is generally what we found, that for low subjects, and if you don't have enough smoothness, the standard methods, the parametric methods, are conservative, and you get much, powerful res much more powerful results with permutation. Um, and I did some small scale, uh, and I found that this was true under both uh, uh, real data and Monte Carlo simulations. Now, this is focusing on the intensity-based results. The cluster size results was harder to sort of find consistency. I, I really never, never, sometimes they're liberal, sometimes they're conservative. I did, really didn't know what to make of the, uh, the cluster size results. So I'm going to skip all that to jump to the work that I just did uh, last year. So uh, evaluations I did were based on Monte Carlo. And of course, that doesn't capture all the vagarities of, of real data, but of course, the real problem is how do you come up with simulated data that captures all that? And in particular, if I want to come up with null data, that's, of course, that's rather expensive. I'd have to get someone. You'd have to pay someone to collect lots of data when someone's lying in the scanner doing nothing. That would be the null case for a task-based experiment. Instead of tapping your fingers, instead of trying to remember a list of words, just lie there at rest. Well, it turns out in the last 10 years, there's been an explosion of interest in resting state fMRI. It turns out people have found really interesting correlations. And maybe at some point, I'll come back and talk about uh, all the analysis work that's gone into modeling mean zero data and modeling the interesting correlations between different parts of the brain. And what's more is that this, this, this trend has been matched with these young whip whippersnappers who were very passionate about open science and sharing their data. So all these people running off and collecting data on subjects lying in the scanner doing nothing have also posted that data online and given it away. So there are now literally tens of thousands of subjects worth of data of people lying in a scanner doing nothing. And uh, I never, uh, it wasn't something I would have run after, but there was a, a young guy in Sweden who is really passionate about permutation methods said like, hey, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's do this. Let's analyze all this resting data with the task software and see what the false positive rates are like. So that's work I uh, took up with uh, Anders Eklund um, in Sweden. And again, these are some of the projects uh, that gave us the, the data. So what do we do? So we use the, we, there's actually a ton of it, but we just picked two sites, probably the places we think that had the best quality data coming from Beijing and Cambridge. Uh, and then we just explored the model space. We wanted to say, well, let's try to do all the, the analyses that people typically do. So one sample t-test or two sample t-test with either 20 or 40 uh, subjects. Ooh, that's a typo. That should be n equals 1 equals 2 equals 20. Sorry there. So a total of 40 or a total, a total of uh, 20 or a total of 40 subjects. We will look at different types of experimental designs. You can either 
uh, stimulate people in a block, sort of like for 30 seconds at a time, then rest, 30 seconds, and rest. Uh, or in this case here, 10 seconds on off, 30 seconds. Or you can do an event-related design, which is just individual events that are sort of instantaneous. There are lots of choices about how you manipulate the data, pre-process it. So we use a range of smoothness. And we, with the knowledge that the random field theory probably it needs that smoothness. So it may, may not work at these lower smooth, smoothnesses, but should work at higher smooth, smoothnesses. And both looking at both the intensity base, the voxel wise, and the cluster base. That's the extent based analysis. And of course, when you use the cluster based method, you have to set this cluster defining threshold. So we use the two most typically used uh, thresholds. So when we looked, so, so we had, so we used over 1,000 subjects and we did um, uh, 5,000 random draws into samples of 20 or samples of 40 and analyze these, this data over and over uh, using drawing from all these, these null data sets. And then we just asked the question, what proportion of all these experiments uh, produced one or more activations? Because the data is null, any of those activations are false positives, all right? So, uh, and so this is our main result is basically what is the false positive rate? And for voxel-wise inference, we got what I had seen many times in the past, which is uh, basically the standard methods are conservative. Uh, the format of these, these plots here is that there's B1, B2, E1, E2. These are the different experimental designs. And then we looked at the six, uh, the five common software plus the permutation method. These ones over here are using ordinary least squares. Here you can do a mixed effects analysis, which is slightly more uh, sophisticated, which tries to account for the, tries to distinguish between the between and within subject variants uh, in this uh, fMRI data. Uh, so this is what we've seen before. Also, if you look carefully at these, you see that the ones that work the best are the ones that have the greatest smoothness. So for example, here, the ones that's the most conservative here is in blue is the lowest smoothness where we wouldn't think random field theory should work. So to be clear, all these methods here are using random field theory. And this is just permutation at the end, one simple t-test, two simple t-test. But what we were surprised at is that um, when we use the cluster forming threshold corresponding to an uncorrected p equals 0.01, the false positive rates were just nuts. They were 25, and in some cases, across all the different conditions we looked at, up to 70%. So again, a method that only five, on 5% 5 of the experiments that you ever consider should give one or more false positives, we're finding 50% you know, of the experiments, or 30% we're giving false positives. Again, you can see that the methods that are closest to being accurate are the ones that have the highest smoothness, as we expected because of uh, random field theory's dependence on high smoothness assumption, but this is just, yeah, this is really, really bad, and permutation is there, just stable where it should be right at uh, 5%. So that the slightly better news is that uh, this other cluster forming threshold, which is slightly more stringent, and again, there's no right answer. These are both equally valid. They're just arbitrary ways of defining what is a blob. This actually was better. It's still more erratic than permutation, but it's uh, sometimes was valid, usually slightly invalid, and again, usually the larger smoothness was doing better, um, but it's, uh, basically saying this, this is not so bad, but the other one is really bad. Both are used. It turns out this one is used slightly more. So that's, this is, we worked it out. It's about f five to 7% of the literature has papers that use this threshold, which is pretty bad. Um, and this one is, is, I would say, about 30% literature uses cluster-wise inference using this threshold. Uh, so it's also not great because we could be doing better. We could have more accurate uh, control of false positives here. Um, so the main thing we want to do is figure out, well, what's going on? What, uh, what, is, what is, is falling down? We know that for the random field theory, we have to assume that it's a uh, multivariate, multivariate Gaussian entity, this notion of smoothness to, to ACF with two derivative, derivatives of the origin. And for the cluster size inference in particular, there's an assumption of, of stationarity. And also, well, when, when you dig into it, you, uh, there is another assumption. Not only do you have to assume that there are two derivatives at the origin, you actually are assuming that the ACF is a x squared exponential. That is actually, the, the, the distance function is, the, is proportional to a Gaussian density. Um, so there's actually this, not only do we have stationarity, but not only do we have smoothness, it's a very specific form of the smoothness, so a very specific uh, covariance function. And indeed, when we looked at the, the empirical uh, covariance function, uh, relative uh, correlation function relative to the, uh, the assumed one, you can see that the, the empirical one has much heavier tails 
So this is basically saying that the dependence in space is going on way far beyond what the, 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 the theoretical model is assuming, that, that th this is the equivalent uh, Gaussian kernel with the size that, we, that was estimated from the, from the data. And in fact, the data, just the smoothness just goes on and on and on. So that, that would explain why we're getting, that's one reason why we're getting extra large clusters. The other thing we looked into is, is the stationarity assumption valid? There are different ways you can actually estimate the same kind of roughness that the random field theory is, is, is based on, but we, did, we, all, we looked at that, but we also looked at this very dumb empirical measure, which is whenever we get a cluster, a false po but they all are false positives, right, because the data is null. Whenever we get a cluster, we just make an, we, we write down that vox, that the, the size of that, that cluster into a voxel, and then we do that over and over again. And so basically, this is a map of whenever a cluster hits this voxel, this voxel what is the mean cluster size? And so this is giving us a very empirical method of saying, Hmm, where are the largest clusters? If stationarity holds, the size of clusters should be the same everywhere in the brain. And in fact, we don't see that. There are some areas of the brain, this is the posterior cingulate, which tends to get much bigger clusters, which is saying the stationarity assumption is also problematic. That, that there is some of the structure we can explain. This is where the ventricles are and the white matter, and, and that you, you shouldn't get any activations there in, in, in practice. So that kind of makes sense. And this, you know, if, if the whole map looked kind of like this, that would be all right. But these patterns here, this brightness relative to this is saying, okay, stationarity uh, is not really a, a fair, uh, probably is not a decent assumption here. The other one that helps us get some headlines, uh, do I have it here? Yes, was a, um, a, we found a bug in the software. So we actually found one of the programs that had been used for 15 years, which actually we found that some people were using software A, and then they go to software B to get their threshold and then come back to software A. One minute? How much? One minute. OK. Five minutes. OK. One minute. OK. <laughs> yeah, so people love this. The, as, it, as it turns out, when this bug was fixed, it didn't make that much a difference. Uh, if you look, it's, it's, it's a really simple thing. They, they did simulations. If you ever do spatial simulations with smoothness, you have to take care of the edge, of, edge effects. The simplest way of which is to smooth an image that's too big and then crop down to get data that is not affected by the, the edge effects. Um, and so what did I want? I think I'll skip this then and just go to, uh, yeah, so that we, it was a very highly cited paper, but my colleagues were a bit ambitious about how they interpreted this, and unfortunately I missed this. They basically said, Basically, all of fMRI is destroyed because of this work. Basically, all 40,000 studies is, uh, are you know, wrong. And of course, this is, that's an overstatement. You know, we worked it out. It's a small fraction. And so we changed this. You know, we issued a correction. No big deal. However, we did kind of break the internet. So now if you search for fMRI 40,000, <laughs> there are lots of results about why. It's, and, and this is, has a lot to do with there are a lot of people who have it in for fMRI. They basically feel like it's a, it's a damaged goods and uh, there has lots of problems. So uh, unfortunately, that was my, yeah, that was my uh, experience with uh, general area journals. So what I learned from this is that, uh, you know, you can only go so far with Monte Carlo evaluations. Uh, it's not often that you can get the real data that is addressing the, the exact type of uh, situation you want to evaluate. We were lucky. We actually had a volume of, of null data to evaluate these task methods. Uh, we found that the voxel-wise methods were okay. Uh, with these two different variants of the cluster-wise methods actually have real problems. The one, the, low, the lower cluster forming threshold is, 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 has problems. And basically for these kind of data, which are honestly 20 subjects, 40 subjects, that, that, that doesn't take very long with permutation. There's very little justification not to use these, these resampling methods. In a lot of areas, like in bioinformatics, I think they're quite, they're quite standards. So they just really hadn't caught on in brain imaging. And then just a lesson, yeah, if you are writing for non-technical journals, you have to be very careful. So I'll stop there. Thanks.